Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a good weekend. Hopefully you weren't out of power for too long. Um, we do have some high wind warnings for much of Maine today, as well as some other parts of the East Coast. So make sure your electronic devices are charged as there may be some more power outages coming. So this week we're gonna be finishing up chapter 16. Today we're gonna to work on section 16.4 and 16.6, .6, which will give you the material you need for the first four problems on the homework. And then Wednesday we'll come back and do 16.7. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is standing sound waves. So on Wednesday we learned about standing waves on a string. It turns out that sound can behave very similarly. Now with standing waves on the string, you had these fixed ends um, that were like physically held in place. With sound, you, know, you can't just like clamp down on sound and uh, fix it. So it turns out that pressure is actually what is gonna act as a uh, fixed end with sound waves. So let's suppose we have a tube that is open on both ends. And I'm just going to draw, this is a cross-sectional view, so we're looking inside the tube, like it's, this is like the cut in half view, kind of. Um, and it's open at either end, so we're going to call this an open, open tube. And an example of an open, open tube would be a flute. So I don't know how many of you have ever played a flute. But with the flute, you breathe across the mouthpiece, but your mouth doesn't go over it, so it doesn't close that off. That mouth opening is still open to the atmosphere. And then the other end of the flute is also open to the air. So uh, you'll have atmospheric pressure uh, at either opening, but inside the flute, you can have a different pressure. So an open, open tube where you have sound is one where you know, you, this end is open to the atmosphere, this end is open to the atmosphere. Um, so this would be at atmospheric pressure, and this would be at atmospheric pressure, but the pressure inside here is something else. And so that pressure differential acts like a fixed point. And we learned on Wednesday that when we have a fixed point, a fixed end, we end up having no, we have to have the nodes at the two ends to make a standing wave. So this is going to be exactly like that. So for an open, open tube, The kind of standing waves you're going to get will look just like the standing waves that you had for the standing waves on a string. And the equation is going to be exactly the same as well. So our wavelength is going to be, so we have lambda m is equal to 2L over m, where L is the length of your tube. So instead of, instead of having the length of the string, we have the length of our tube, but it's still a length. And M is going to be the number of anti-nodes. Or also the number of half wavelengths. Now we also learned an equation for frequency. Um, we drive that last time, so I'm not going to redrive it, but we found out that our frequency is equal to m times v over 2l. Now if m equals 1, we have just the v over 2l, so you can also write this expression as m times f sub 1, where f sub 1 is your fundamental frequency, you know, your m equals 1, frequency, the first mode of your standing waves. So if you know what your first frequency is, then you can easily find the others by just multiplying them by whatever your m value is. So are there any questions on the open open tube? All right, so what happens if we have a tube that's closed on both ends? 
So we have here a closed closed tube. Now, your initial instinct may be that this is going to be just like the open open tube, but it turns out that if you close off the ends, you end up having an anti node instead of a node there. So a closed closed tube would look something like this. Its standing waves are going to start and end on anti nodes. And so the wavelength equation is going to look very similar to the one that we have for the uh, open open tube, but there's an important distinction. So if you look here, we have one, two, three, and then half and a half, so four half wavelengths. So uh, if we had a length L, four half wavelengths is the same thing as two whole wavelengths, so our wavelength here would have to be a half, uh, if a half of our total length L. So we're going to have lambda m is equal to 2L over m still, and that m is still going to be the number of half wavelengths, but it's no longer going to be the number of anti-nodes. So this is our length, and this is the number of half wavelengths. But if we count our, uh, our anti-nodes here, we have one, two, three, four, five anti-nodes, whereas we only have four half wavelengths. So for the closed closed tube, what we want to count instead are the number of nodes. So we have one, two, three, four nodes. So instead it's the number of nodes. And in both cases, the number of half wavelengths that always works. So uh, if you forget which one's nodes and which one's anti-nodes, you can just count the number of half wavelengths you have. Um, and just recall that you have you know, half of a half wavelength here and half of a half wavelength here to give us a whole half wavelength. So total of four half wavelengths. So are there any questions on the close close too? Alright, well we looked at it, the open open tube and the closed closed, but you can imagine we might also have a tube that is open closed. So if you think about a clarinet, uh, you have to put your mouth over the mouthpiece, so you're closing off one end completely, but the other one is open to the air. So that's an example of an open closed or closed open tube. So an open closed tube, we could draw schematically like this. And we learned that when we're open to the air, we have to have a node, and when we're closed to the air, we have to have an anti-node. So our waves would look something like this. Where we have a node at that end, and then an anti-node at the other end. So that's the kind of standing waves we would get for an open closed tube. Now the equation is a little bit complicated here. So we're gonna start with the, we're gonna do kind of the same derivation we did for standing waves on a string on back on Wednesday. We're gonna look at the smallest possible case we could have. So if we need to have a node at one end and an anti-node at the other, then the smallest situation we could have here would be where we have a node on one side and an anti-node on the other. So we have a total of a quarter wavelength. So we have half of a half wavelength. So we know that our total length is L. So if we have a quarter of a wavelength then, then we have one fourth lambda equals L, which tells us that lambda has to be four times our total length L. So that's our smallest case. 
Now, the next case we could have is if we have a whole half wavelength and then half of a half wavelength. So, our next situation would be like this. So that's going to give us three-fourths of a wavelength, because we're kind of just missing this other little bit over here. So we have three-fourths of a wavelength. So if our length is L, then we're going to have L is equal to three-fourths of our wavelength. So if we solve out for wavelength, this tells us that Lambda is equal to 4 thirds L, so it's a third of its original value when we had just the quarter of a wavelength situation. Now what about the next situation? So we can add, throw in another half wavelength. And so we have something like this. So this time around, we have a whole wavelength and a quarter, so we have five fourths of the wavelength. So if we still have length L, we're going to have the L is equal to five fourths lambda, which tells us lambda is equal to four fifths of our length L, or yes, four fifths. So you can see that now this is one-fifth of our original value. So if you want to write a general equation for this, we can write it as lambda sub m is equal to 4L over m. But we have to be a little careful here. And kind of the tricky thing here is that our m, it can't be any integer because we didn't see, you know, 4 over 2 show up anywhere or 4 over 4. It can only be odd numbers. So our modes here are going to be, m is going to be 1, 3, 5, so on and so forth. So these would be the possible configurations we could have that would give us standing waves. Um, and these are also called modes. I haven't used that term a lot, but another way you could call, you know, the first mode would be, you know, our m equals one case. In this case, for the open closed tube, uh, tube, the second mode would be the m equals three case. Our third mode would be the m equals five case. And our other two situations, the first mode is m equals one, second is m equals two, so on and so forth. So those ones, it's a little easier. But this one, we lose the even numbered ones. We only have odd numbered ones. So that's um, a little bit trickier. Are there any questions on this so far? All right, so we can also find our frequency. So we're going to do a derivation very similar to the one we did for our standing waves on Wednesday. So we know that our frequency is V over lambda just re rearranging the equation v equals f lambda. And so this is the same thing as v over 4l over m. Oops. And so then if we go ahead and do the same thing as v over 1 times m over 4l. And so we're going to have that our frequency is equal to m times v over 4l. Now if m equals 1, we just have four, uh, uh, v over 4l, so this is the same thing as m times f1 once again. So are there any questions on this part?
All right, so let's do an example. Let's suppose we have a soda bottle and it is 22 centimeters tall. And we blow across the top of the soda bottle and we make a sound. So our question is, what are the first three modes? Or what, are, what, are, what is the frequency of the first three modes? So that's what we want to know, is we want to know the frequency of the first three modes. So the first thing you have to do is identify what kind of tube we're working with here. So a soda ball, it has a closed off bottom and then it's open at the top. You know, we're blowing across the top, but we're not covering that top with our mouth. So it's going to be an open closed tube. And so this tells us that we're going to be working with the frequency equation that f sub m is equal to m v over 4l. Now at first it may seem like we don't have enough information to solve this because we don't have speed, but our bottle is making a sound. We know the speed of sound, so the v here is going to be our speed of sound. So if you want to find our uh, first mode, we're going to plug in what we have here. So this is going to be 1 for our m. Our v is 343 meters per second, because that's the speed of sound in air. And then for our length is 22 centimeters. That's the same thing as 0.22 meters. We're going to plug that into our calculator, and we will get Three eighty nine point eight hertz, which we're going to round to two sig figs. So we'll have F sub one is equal to three hundred and ninety hertz, and that's the first mode. So the next mode, since there is no um, m equals 2 case for the closed open tube. Our next mode would be the m equals 3 case. So if we want to solve for that, which before I move on to that, are there any questions on this first part? All right, so now that we know the first one, we can actually make our lives a little easier. If we recall that f sub m is equal to m times f sub 1. So instead of having to plug in v over 4l over and over again, we can just use that number. So this is going to be our m now is 3, and then our f1 we said was 389.8 hertz. Plug this into our calculator and we'll get 1100 and... 69 hertz, which we round that to two sig figs, tells us that f sub 3 is equal to 1200 hertz. And then our next, our final mode we have to be concerned about is going to be n equals 5. So we'll have f sub 5 is equal to 5 times 389.8 hertz, which works out to be about 1949 hertz, or to two sig figs, f5 is equal to 
1900 hertz. So are there any questions on that one? All right. The one thing I kind of forgot to touch upon when we were talking about this earlier um, is what is what does the m correspond to physically in our equation? So we we kind of worked our way through the equation and saw we needed an m equal to one or three or five to make our equation work. But what does that actually correspond to? So if we think about our situation where we have the open closed tube, so something like this, and we know that lambda is equal to 4L over M. Well, if we count our number of nodes, that's not going to work. If we count our number of antinodes, that also doesn't work. So the way we get M is it's if we were to double this. So we can think about doubling this on the other side. So just an exact mirror. And actually, let me just do that in a different color for you. It will be a little easier to see than the dashed line. So we're just going to kind of do a imaginary piece on the other side. So M in this case would be the number of antinodes you have if you were to mirror your string. So we have one, two, three, four, five antinodes. So it's the number of antinodes if you mirrored your wave. So a little bit weird, a little bit more complicated than the other two situations. The closed open one is the most odd one um, and a little bit trickier to think about. Are there any questions on that? Now we've already talked about interference a little bit. So far we talked about constructive and destructive interference when we're working with the standing waves on the string um, or other kinds of waves. Um, sound waves we can do the exact same thing with. So they, have, they can interfere with each other. You can make sounds that are bigger or smaller than the one would be on its own. And so we're going to start with a kind of an oversimplified case. Um, so we know that sound travels in spherical waves, but if we had two speakers and a person, you know, right in a straight line, we could kind of treat this as though it's happening in 2D, just your normal sine cosine waves. So we're going to do the linear case first as like a simple basic example, and then we're going to expand to the spherical waves case. So. These little funny symbols I'm drawing over here are supposed to be speakers. The textbook has a much nicer illustration of this, so, um, but this is my best attempt at them. So let's suppose we have two speakers and they're emitting sounds. And so our first speaker is one wavelength from the other one. So the distance between these two, I'll use black for that. which we're going to use a delta d to denote, is going to be equal to one wavelength. And so this sound is playing from the speaker. And our listener is over here. So I'm going to be the listener, and I'm standing over here listening to our sound. And so we want to figure out whether the sound that reaches me is going to be louder or quieter than just this one speaker on its own. Well, if you were to draw the sound wave for this speaker, we can see since they're a wavelength apart, this one's going to be starting out at the same one that the other one did. And so it's going to be the exact mirror of these. And I've drawn one on top of the other because these sound waves would superimpose and have the, you know, they match each other exactly. And so in that case, we wouldn't be able to see it. So I just drew one on top of the other. Now, 
To do this problem, we have to make the assumption that the two speakers are playing sound at the same frequency, the sound has the same wavelength, and also has the same amplitude. So all those conditions we're assuming are true. What happens to these waves? Well, we can see that our peaks line up with our peaks and our troughs line up with our troughs. So our resulting wave would look something like this. So we add them together, we'd get a wave with bigger peaks and deeper troughs. So this is kind of this plus this equals this. Now, what if instead of spacing them a whole wavelength apart, we space them apart by half a wavelength? So we'll just do this one below. So we still have this one speaker, and I'm going to move the other speaker a little closer. So now we have the distance between the two. Delta D is equal to one half lambda. And so this one's going to start out like this. They come down and it's gonna, you know, sound's gonna carry out. And I'm standing over here listening to our sound. Now the red wave is starting off half a wave like we like shifted over from the other one. So well it's starting out the same starting place, but it's going to be shifted by half the wavelength. So this one's actually going to go, you know, it starts out with the same shape as this one, but they're half a wavelength apart. So where there's a peak on one, there's going to be a trough on the other, and vice versa. So these end up canceling each other out. So our resulting wave would look like this. It would just be flat. Everything is canceled everywhere. So are there any questions kind of on the conceptual approach to this? All right, so what would our equations be then? When do we get constructive interference and when do we get destructive interference? Well, we said that we get constructive interference when we have our two speakers placed a wavelength apart. So we know that's one case that works. What's the general case? Well, it turns out that if our half length distance, so delta D, the distance between our two speakers, um, and it doesn't have to be speakers, you know, if you had two cats, let's say, and somehow they were meowing the exact same frequency, the sounds at the exact same amplitude, you know, or you could have musical instruments like you're playing two clarinets and they're at the exact same frequency and everything, those could also be your sounds. So delta D is just the distance between your two uh, sources of sound, so, which is also referred to as the path length distance. For constructive interference, it's going to be equal to any integer multiple of our wavelength. So m equals 0, 1, 2, so on and so forth. This is constructive interference. Because you can think, well, if we were one wavelength apart and then we moved them another wavelength apart, that's still going to be constructive interference because you have a whole wavelength and then another whole wavelength for two. So kind of any integer multiple is going to work. For destructive interference, what ends up working is if we have delta D is equal to m plus one half lambda. And again, m is some integer. Zero, one, two, so on and so forth. This is destructive. And you can think if you had them, um, you know, half a wavelength apart, and then you took one of your speakers and you moved it over by a whole wavelength, well, the whole wavelength, our uh, sound wave is going to go from 
where it started and cycle back to where it started. So moving it by an integer over is not going to change it. It's that one half wavelength that's going to make the difference. It's going to make it destructive because um, you know, if we just shift things over by a wavelength, that just brings us back to our starting place. Are there questions on this so far? All right, so that was kind of like our simplified linear case. What happens though if we look at our spherical waves as spherical waves? You know, our sound waves as spherical waves, I should say. So let's suppose we have one speaker here, which I'm going to call S sub 1. We know that it emits sound in spherical waves, and of course my board is only two-dimensional, so I have to draw them as circles, but these are spheres. And let's suppose we have a second speaker, somewhere over here, and I'll call this one S2. And this one also emits sound in spherical waves. So where are going to be our places of max constructive interference and where are going to be our places of max destructive interference? Well to understand that we have to think about what this figure represents. So these blue lines we're drawing for the waves, these are the crests of the waves, these are the peaks. So our troughs, we don't draw them on, but you can think if you're going from peak to peak, you're going to have a trough halfway in between. So kind of this halfway in between point is where your troughs are going to be. We know that we have peaks when crests line up with crests or troughs line up with troughs. So an example of a peak would be this spot right here. Because we have a crest of the red wave and a crest of the blue wave lining up and meeting each other. Now, an example of a place where we have maximum destructive interference, we have to look for a place where a crest lines up with a trough. Right here we have a crest of the red wave, and when we follow it to the halfway point of the blue wave, we're going to have a trough there. So I want to use a different color for this, for destructive interference. So we're going to have destructive interference right here. So just kind of conceptually, when you're looking at spherical waves, the places where the crests overlap, or where the troughs overlap, you can see, I think some troughs are overlapping in here. It's a little harder to see because we don't actually draw the troughs on there. But um, you're going to have constructive interference and the places where the crests meet the troughs, you're going to have destructive interference. Now, we can measure the distance from our speakers to our point of interest. So I'm going to call this distance here. R sub 1, because it's the distance from speaker 1 to our point of interest. And we'll call this distance here R sub 2, because it's the distance from that speaker to our point of interest. Now I could do the same thing for the black dot. We could measure this distance, and I'm going to call this one R1, and I'm just going to use a prime to denote it just to say it's a different distance, so it's still relating to speaker 1, but it's a different distance now. And we could also measure the distance between speaker 2 and our uh, point of interest, so we're going to say that's R2 prime. Now the difference between these be is something we could calculate mathematically. Um, and so it, what it turns out matters is that the path, length, the path length difference here, so however long R1 is compared to R2 um, is going to turn out is the key thing. So we can see that we have one wavelength, two wavelengths, three wavelengths here. We have one two here, so they're off by a wavelength here, 
which makes sense that that's going to give us constructive interference. Now here, going this way, we have one, two, three. We have one, two, and a half. So over here, they're going to be off by half a wavelength, which makes sense why it's destructive interference. So our equations are going to look very similar to what they did for the linear case, but they're slightly different. in that we're going to use R's instead of D's and we're going to define the path length difference with an absolute value sign. Because it doesn't matter whether um, which of our distances is bigger mathematically. So we're going to say that delta R, which is what we're using instead of delta D, and that's equal to the distance from our point of our sound, or the point of interest to our, our object 2, minus R1, which is from the point of interest to sound source 1. And that's how we're going to find delta R. And to get constructive interference, we're going to have delta R is equal to m lambda, where m equals one, uh, 0, 1, 2, so on and so forth. I'm just constructive. And then for destructive, delta R is going to be equal to m plus 1 half lambda, m equals 0, 1, 2, so on and so forth. And that's destructive. So are there any questions on this so far? All right, if there are no questions, let's move into an example. So let's suppose we have Cupcake the Kitten. standing over here and her friend Joey Cat is over here. And they're standing six meters apart from each other. And we're going to call this distance, so this is Cupcake. I'll just use a little C to denote Cupcake. And this cat is Joey. I'll use a little J. And so we're going to call this distance here RCJ to denote that it's a distance from Cupcake to Joey. And that's equal to six meters. Now I'm over here. And I'm standing eight meters away from Cupcake. So this I'm going to call R M C for the distance from me to Cupcake is 8.0 meters. And both cats managed to meow at the exact same frequency, at the exact same instant. So we have frequency of their meow is 343 hertz. And so what we want to know is first what is the wavelength of the sound and then secondly the sound that reaches me is that going to be constructive or destructive interference? Am I going to hear something really loud or am I going to hear something really quiet maybe not hear it at all? So the way we're going to solve this problem is the first thing we have to find is the wavelength. And that we're going to use our old friend V equals F lambda for. So we want to know lambda 
We know that's V over F. Well, our speed here, they're meowing, so it's going to be traveling at the... Meows will travel at the speed of sound and air, so that's going to be 343 meters per second. We're going to divide that by 343 hertz, which is going to leave us with 1 meter, so our wavelength is 1 meter. Now, the tricky part is figuring out whether it's constructive or destructive interference. To do this, we need to know what the path length difference is between these two sounds that are traveling to me. So the first thing I have to do is figure out what the distance is from me to Joey. So we're going to call this one R M J. So it's the distance from me to Joey. And you can kind of see that this looks like it forms a right triangle. So to figure out this distance, we're just going to use Pythagorean theorem. So we're going to have uh, our mj, that's our hypotenuse, is equal to the square root of, we're going to have r c j squared plus r m c squared, so r m j is equal to the square root of 6 meters squared plus 8 meters quantity squared. So it turns out the distance between me and Joey is 10 meters. So to figure out whether we have constructive interference or destructive interference, the next step we have to do is find our path length difference. So delta r is equal to, now we have to figure out what our r2 and our r1 are in this case, because we have three different lengths here. Well, I am the point of interest here, so we want to use lengths that are relating to me. So this one here and this one here, these both are, you know, me relative to Joey and me relative to Cupcake. Those are the two we want to use. This distance here is Cupcake to Joey. It doesn't affect how the sound is reaching me. Like, this is the path the sound is taking to get to me. This is also the path, the path the sound is taking to get to me. So those two are going to be the relevant ones we want to use. So we're going to have this equal to our MJ minus RMC. And so kind of the reason why the absolute value matters here is we could call either one of these, one in uh, R1 and the other one R2, it doesn't matter which one we pick. So the absolute value just kind of lets us know that, you know, if we were to get a negative sign, it wouldn't have any physical meaning because we could easily just say, okay, well, I'm going to call this one R2 now instead of R1, and so it wouldn't really make a difference. So this is going to be 10 meters minus uh, 8 meters. So our path length difference is going to turn out to be 2 meters. Now the last part of this problem is kind of a pattern matching game. So if you recall our equations for constructive interference and destructive interference, we know constructive gives us delta r equals m lambda and destructive we have delta r equals m plus one half lambda. So we want to figure out whether it matches this situation or this situation. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to divide both sides by r, I'm sorry, by lambda and see whether we have an integer or not. So if we have delta r over lambda, well our delta r is 2 meters, our lambda is 1 meter, so it's going to turn out to be 2 over 1 is going to give us 2. So this is the situation where our, we have an integer, so m equals 2, 
So this tells us constructive interference. Because we can write it as um, delta r equals 2 lambda implies constructive interference. So are there any questions on this? Are there any other questions? I know we're kind of out of time today. Um, I'm expecting that Wednesday, since we only have one session to cover, it's going to be a little bit shorter, so we should hopefully have lots of time for questions on Wednesday. Uh, but if you have any brief questions, feel free to ask them in our last few minutes. All right, if you have no further questions, then uh, have a great day.